Can you think of something that will make that not true? So what makes you think that belongs to that graph? Can you give me an equation for that one? Questions all have one purpose, and that's to make the learner think. Right, we've got an x squared plus 6x plus 3. Well, we've got an interesting one. Let's check this one out. I think that the range of questions you can ask is enormous. Of y equals 4x minus 3. Straight away, what do we know about that line? What do we start off with on the right-hand side? You've decided that this is what? I want you to give me a possible equation of this graph, please. I enjoy questioning and I enjoy learners being involved in their questioning. I think that is really important. So I try and make sure when I'm questioning that as many learners are involved as possible. Right, OK, put your boards down, thank you. Now let's have a look at those then. Do you like them all? We normally talk of closed questions and open questions. You know, closed questions with one, one answer and open questions is a range of possible answers. One head and there's one again. Why is it always winning? Really... 16 coins are tossed. I think you have to be able to ask the students the right sort of questions. To try and find a way of asking a question that opens things up rather than close things down. Write the number one in index notation. I need this value. The beauty of that, of course, is that it gives learners opportunity to be adventurous if they're feeling confident with that particular topic. Because that, that's great fun, because that makes a wonderful mathematical discussion that the whole, the whole class can share in then. When you're dealing with a whole class, one of the things to, to do is to give everybody a fair chance to think and respond. Lots of good answers. A class. That's it, write that in log form now. You've no excuse. Uh, if you've written the question, then fair. you've got to convert it to logs. What's that called? When, when you've got a small group, you can push learners further. Explain. Oh, oh so if it's a minus seven, then yeah. 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 zero, then... That's it. Now, does that work for everything? I don't think I have a conscious way of deciding when, I, yeah. when to intervene. But generally speaking, if students seem to be going in the right direction, I'll either leave them to carry on or I might just give them a little nudge along the way. So what could you do to 125 to get it to be between 12 and 13 and 15? And double it. Double it, OK. So how could we double it using powers of 2, 3 and 5? If they are uh, going down the wrong route, then I'll try and ask a question which will bring them back to the right route or bring them back to the beginning and say, start from this step, what do we do next? You said you wanted to double that number. So if you just write... Oh, why can't we do it to the power of uh, 10 then? So if we have something to the power of 10, is that going to be double? What about this one, then? Can you just defy to me why that one goes there? X to the 4. Because the temptation for a teacher is to do the thinking for the learner. The teacher's role is to challenge and challenge and challenge. So you think the graph looks like y equals x squared, do you? What was your justification for this one? Oh, you don't... Try and get them to make the connections. Try and reflect it back so that they're doing the thinking. Sine 2a cos a. Therefore, that's not equal to sine a plus sine a. Okay, so you've shown it by counter example. I am still not convinced about that.